So let's talk about the EKG. The electrocardiogram um, is a system that we use to, um, here, let me back up, way back up. Okay, the EKG is a, a tool we use to evaluate the electrical change in the heart. And because the heart has this intimate relationship with electricity, you know, namely action potential and membrane potential change, we can use this relatively simple tool. It's easy to measure electricity, right? It's the, the meters are cheap, wires are cheap. So the EKG is a relatively inexpensive way to evaluate the heart. And it does so by looking at how the electricity is moving through that system. Now, remember that there's kind of two electrical things happening in the heart all the time. One is the conducting system, which we've been talking about, transmitting those excitation signals from the SA node all the way through to the rest of the heart. The other electrical thing that's happening in the heart is the depolarization and repolarization of the actual contracting cells, right? Because remember, the conducting system cells don't contract. They just activate the contracting cells, okay? So, and we'll talk about both of those as we go here. Okay, so first off, if we're gonna talk about electricity, we gotta talk about pluses and minuses. And in the EKG, this becomes a little more challenging because the heart is a three-dimensional structure, but electricity is a one-dimensional phenomena, right? In other words, we, we can measure positive or negative, that's it, that's how we get in electricity. So we have to talk a little about what our meters are showing. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a sort of con concept diagram of a heart cell. And what's happening is depolarization, right? The inside of the cell is becoming positive, the outside of the cell is becoming negative because this cell is activating. Okay, so then we have our meter. We're, we have one uh, probe on one end of the cell, another on the opposite end. So what we see is when positive charge is moving towards the positive lead, we get an upward deflection. We get a positive deflection, right? I think that makes sense. Now, when <coughs> that, um, uh, let's do the opposite one down here, okay? If we have negative charge, moving um, towards the positive lead, then we get a downward deflection, okay? So the, uh, a positive deflection is ch positive charge moving towards a positive or negative charge moving towards a negative, right? If we're talking about the opposite, negative moving towards positive or positive moving towards negative, that's where we get our downward deflection, okay? so. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, I've given you a bunch of ways to look at it depending on how your brain works and I'm not going to go through each of those, but essentially that is the short version. Positive moving towards positive gets us a positive deflection, negative moving towards negative gets us a negative deflection. Okay, so let's look at our two electrical things that are happening. At the top here, we have our contractile cells. We know that because we have this big plateau phase that we've been talking about for the last few days, right? Here in, and this is our EKG. So what we're seeing is um, the QRS, this is part of the EKG, we're missing the, um, the atrial part. The QRS complex, now let's talk about naming. In an EKG, we name the squiggles, okay, with alphabet. All right, so the first squiggle is P, the next squiggle is Q, R, S, and then the last squiggle is T, okay? So we start at P and we go to T. You'll notice in my um, chart here, there is no P, it's because we're only looking at the ventricle. All right, so the Q, R, S, that big pointy bit that makes the EKG very recognizable, that is the, the, the representation of ventricular depolarization. And lo and behold, it lines right up with our big upstroke of our action potential on these contractile cells, right? So QRS, what creates this QRS complex is oodles of oodles of cardiac cells 
all depolarizing at about the same time. Okay, so we get a lot of charge moving and that we see is the QRS. Now, we get our plateau phase. It's during this phase, remember, that actual contraction is occurring. In other words, that the heart's actually doing its job, moving blood into the circulation. Well, what do we see in the EKG during the contracting phase? Not very much in the normal, right? Because you don't have electricity moving. You just have contraction happening. Now, in this area, we call this the ST segment. The ventricles are doing the, they're contracting during this time. So, if we have an area of heart that is not contracting normally, maybe we've got a artery that's blocked, right? Or maybe we have an area that's been injured in the past. We will often see changes in the ST segment that relate to ventricular contraction because that's what's happening at that time. Okay, so um, little spoiler for clinical medicine, that ST segment is one of our primary ways of diagnosing an MI, a myocardial infarction, right? A reduction in blood flow to an area of the heart. And it's, its location is because it occurs when the heart is actually contracting. All right, so um, the, when we look at the QRS, um, depending on which lead or which um, part of the EKG we're looking at, typically the Q is an upstroke, right? The R is a downstroke and the S is another upstroke. So our first deflection is upward. Why? Because when we measure from the front of the heart, the heart, front of the heart tends to contract first before the back of the heart does. Okay, more on that in a minute. All right, so now why do we have a mixed deflection? Some of our QRS is going up, some of it is going down. Well, um, again, it depends on where you are measuring, okay? But the short version is some of the electricity, the part going up, is moving towards the lead. Some of the electricity, the part going towards the back, is moving away from the lead. Do you see? So we have an up and a down. Okay, more on that in a minute. Okay, now if we uh, look a little further, okay, so we have our plateau phase. What happens after that is we finally get our potassium channels opening, right? And we get our repolarization phase. Well, during repolarization, we still have electricity moving. So we can still identify this um, by, in the EKG. What we see in repolarization is what we call the T wave, all right? So QRS, signal to the ventricles to contract, ST, actually contracting, and then T wave, repolarizing, okay? So by the end of the T wave, the contractile cells of the ventricles are repolarized and are now waiting for another signal to contract. So that is gonna be our um, T to P interval, which we'll talk more about later. So you see this is flat, like this is flat, because there's no electrical change happening, right? Okay, so now let's look at all the pieces together. Um, so this is an EKG, you're gonna, uh, hopefully you'll learn to love it. And even if you don't, you'll get to use it anyway, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so we start at zero times zero. P wave, okay, is the first deflection. The P wave is the atria depolarizing. Okay, so remember we said the SA node sends uh, its signal across the atria, then the atria contract. Well, that atrial depolarization we see in the EKG is the P wave, okay? The QRS then is ventricular depolarization, all right? And what follows that is gonna be ventricular contraction. All right, so you might be wondering, well, where is atrial repolarization? Shouldn't we see that? Yes, we should see that, but we don't. And the reason we don't is because atrial repolarization is happening at the same time as ventricular depolarization is. Now, think about the anatomy you remember of the heart. Atria, very thin-walled, kind of pathetic chambers, 
right? Ventricles, big, beefy, thick-walled things. So it means that the signal from the atria just gets squashed inside the signal of the ventricles because the ventricles are so much bigger. So we don't see a wave for atrial repolarization. It's actually hidden inside there. In another way of putting that is an atrial T wave, because remember the T wave is repolarization of the ventricles. Where is the atrial T wave? We don't see it. It's buried inside the QRS. Okay? Now, let's keep moving on. So between the end of um, atrial repolaris or sorry, atrial depolarization, okay, and the beginning of ventricular depolarization we have the interval that's called the PR interval. It's about 0.16 seconds. Not surprisingly, it's about the same as the AV nodal delay because that's what's causing it, right? Okay, so the signal has gone from SA node to AV node, and then in the AV node, we get that 100, 150 millisecond delay, okay? Well, the atria are contracting during that delay, and we see that as the P wave. So the PR interval is a decent approximation of AV nodal delay, all right? Now, let us look, uh, so we get our QRS, and then we look at the T wave. Okay, so if you compare the T wave, which is ventric ventricular repolarization, and the QRS, you'll notice that the T wave takes place over a longer period of time. In other words, it's not as spiky. It's not as short and, and brisk as the QRS. And it's because compared to depolarization, repolarization is less coordinated. So our repolarization takes place over a longer period of time. We see that in the EKG as a wider T wave than our QRS. Now, we also see that the T wave is lower. It doesn't go as high. Okay, well, why? Well, <clears throat> um, because we've spread out the repolarization over a longer period of time, each, uh, the per time change is less. Um, so we have more, our, our ionic motion is more spread out, okay, in the T wave. So it's longer and not as tall, okay. So we have a couple of other intervals to look at. The QT interval, in other words, um, uh, uh, from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T. Um, well, I would call it the beginning of the Q to the beginning of the T is um, systole, so the ventricles are actually contracting. And then the ST segment um, also occurs during systole and is primarily uh, what's happening in the ST segment is actual ventricular contraction as opposed to electrical change. It's why it's flat, right? So P, QRST, PR interval, QT interval, ST segment. Those are all critical bits of the EKG that you're going to know in the future. Yes? And you said you would say the QT ends at the beginning of the T instead of the end, like it shows there. Yes, uh, I would say Q to T. Um, you know, there's different ways of defining intervals, but we're, we're going to call it that way for now. Okay. okay. All right. So what about the rest of what we're looking at? What are all the lines and graphs and all that? Okay. So on the y-axis is millivolts. So remember, we are looking at electrical change. Okay. The x-axis is, of course, time. Now, over the, the years, EKGs have been standardized so that they always have the same scale, okay? The scale goes from uh, plus one to minus one. Minus one would be down here. Each horizontal line, so that's each of these, that's um, the small hor horizontal lines is one millivolt, okay? The, um, no, it's point, point one millivolt. Sorry, correct that. Ten, 10 horizontal lines equals 1 millivolt. So that's all 10 of these. That means each horizontal line is 0.1 of a millivolt. The vertical lines are time, also standardized. So the heavy dark lines, each of those is point, uh, 0.2 seconds. 
each smaller line is 0.04 seconds. So you can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's 5.04 seconds. That means that's a 0.2 seconds, right? Um, <clears throat> the normal voltages, you know, directly over the heart, we'll see 3 to 4 millivolts. Um, out towards the limbs, the electricity has further to travel. So we're going to see um, a lower amplitude or height and depth of the um, uh, tracing. Okay, so heart rate is one of the key things that we can obtain from an EKG. And this is one of these where you have to kind of use the graphing skills that you developed in middle school, right? I know that's dusty stuff. Okay. So <laughs> you can determine the heart rate in a couple of different ways, but they all work in the same way. You pick uh, a spot, so let's say the beginning of the P wave, and then you count the number of boxes until the beginning of the next P wave or whatever that whatever spot you can start. Nothing special about the beginning of the P wave. A lot, what I usually do is I pick the peak of the QRS and I count over to the next QRS. It just has to be same point to same point. Now, what do you do with the, with the numbers you get? Well, there's an easy to remember one, and then there's an easy to use one, all right? The rule of 1500 says this, count the number of little boxes between two points, and then take 1500 divided by that number. Easy to remember, hard to do, because you've got to count all the little tiny boxes, right? So let's see, that's, um, we'll say that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So 1,500 divided by 22 is, math wizards, 68. Okay, does that sound like a reasonable heart rate? Yeah. So see, that one's easy to remember, but you got to do a lot of counting. The one that's easier to use, but a little harder to remember, is the rule of 300. And why it's harder to remember, you see that sequence of numbers down there? You have to somehow work that into your head. Okay? 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 43, 37. Now, how does this work? These are darker lines. <laughs> see? Harder to remember, right? Okay, so if we count the darker lines, okay, this is 1. This is two, this is three, this is, oh, I lost track. <laughs> One, two, three, four, and a smidge, okay? So how does this work? 300 would be one box, 150 would be two boxes, 100, three, 75, four. So that's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we're between 60 and 75. See? So it's easier to use, but harder to remember. Um, now, many of you have seen EKGs, and you, you know that the computer puts a rate <laughs> on it. All right, here's the thing. You're not going to like this. Don't trust the computer's rate. Here's why. Not all, they were, the, the rate the computer picks out is perfect if the heart, if it's a normal EKG. All right. If the rhythm is disturbed, in other words, it's not a regular rhythm, the computer is guessing. All right. So it's up to you, smarter than the computer, right, to look at the EKG and make sure that the rate it's telling you is approximately correct. Okay. So that's two ways to figure it out. 1,500 divided by the number of small squares or the rule of 300 and the... Uh, um, 300, 150, 175, 60. Now you could just stop there, right? Because that is going to encounter most of your heart rates, but you're going to miss some of the lower ones. Okay. News flash, we aren't flat. All right. Electricity is a one dimensional measurement. So in order to understand the EKG, okay, when we do an EKG, we put leads all over the patient. Why? Well, we're trying to see that electrical activity in the heart from lots of different perspectives so that we can build up a three-dimensional picture from our one-dimensional measurements. Okay, so all of this, all this mess is showing you is that we can take the same electrically active thing, in other words, this mass of tissue right here, 
And depending on where we measure it, we will get three different readings from the same electrical change, right? So over here on the negative, um, you'll notice that our positive lead is in the negative area. Our negative lead is in the positive area. So as charge moves from inside out, we're going to see a strongly negative deflection from these two leads. Now, if we look over here, we've got our leads in different places. Here, our negative lead is in the negative area. Our positive lead is in the positive area. So we see a strong positive deflection. Same thing changing two different views. See that? Then our middle one, we have our lead sort of on both sides of the negative area. And here we read zero, not because nothing's moving, but because it's approximately balanced. So all this is trying to show you is that if we look at one heart from multiple different perspectives in electricity, we're going to see different tracings. Even though the heart's doing one thing, we're looking at it from multiple points of view. All right, And essentially, this is the fundamental of how an EKG works. We hook up a bunch of leads to the patient, and we measure the cardiac activity from different areas, from different points. Okay, so we have a very simplified EKG here, right? We have two leads, one on the right side of the chest, one on the left side of the chest. So when we measure the EKG in this simplified fashion, what we see is a positive deflection. And the reason for that is, um, number one, the heart is angled towards the left, okay? And it depolarizes from top to bottom. So that means there's always an electrical vector. There's always an electrical direction going this way, right? And because of that, if we put a negative lead over here and a positive lead over here, we're going to see that as a positive de deflection, all right? Now, repolarization follows the same path, so we see the same deflection, right? We see the same um, movement in that same direction. All right, but we have to make it more complicated because that's the way EKGs are. All right, so now we're going to hook up three leads, and we're going to um, make what's called Eindhoven's Triangle. And uh, this is an electrical circle or a circuit um, in the end. And what it allows us to do is it, it allows us to make inferences about lead three from the other two leads. Okay, so we got to do just a tiny little bit of physics. The physics here, because it's connected in a circle, right, it says that lead one plus lead three will always equal lead two because they're all measuring the same thing, okay? So if we combine that with the normal vector, the normal angle of depolarization, which is my red line there, we get some examples of what we see in a more realistic EKG. Okay, so lead one, for example, is measuring between here and here. So we tend to see a positive deflection in our QRS and our T, right? Because generally speaking, the electricity is moving from uh, the negative side to the positive side. Now, if we look at lead two, right, lead two, negative over here, positive over here, we get kind of the same thing. Depolarization is going from left to right, so we see that as positive deflections, right? And then over here in lead three, um, now we have uh, um, the positive is here and the negative is here, but we still generally have left to right direction, so we see this as positive as well. But they don't all three look the same, okay? That's akin to my first uh, slide, which now I can't get to, that one, right? So we're looking at the heart from three different perspectives, and we're therefore seeing three different patterns, okay? All right, so let's add more leads. Now we're going to see some big deflection changes. Um, we're also going to get, we've made our electricity more complicated, all right? 
Not a physics class, so we're not going to talk about how the resistance, the 5,000 ohms, how the resistance coils matter here, okay? So just take my word for it. This is what you see when you hook it up like this. Um, so in addition to leads one, two, and three, we have leads one through six. We call these the precordial leads or the, um, um, the uh, lateral leads. And um, we'll do one through six. They actually go further around the body, okay? So there's more than V1 through V6. But I like these six because it shows you kind of a progression. So if we put a lead here on the um, right side of the heart, so we're actually right of the midline, that's V1. Well, our vector, our electrical vector is always going towards the left, right? So we have a downward deflection in V1 because the electricity is moving away from our lead instead of towards it like we've seen so far. V2, same thing, right? The electricity is, t for the most part, moving away. And we see that we have a stronger downward deflection than we do in um, uh, V3. Okay, V3 is interesting because it's the most balanced. In other words, it has about the same negative deflection as positive deflection, at least in the QRS, right? And um, it's because of its location. V3 is almost directly at the apex. So um, you're, you're getting strong, uh, strong vector along that line, but you're getting both the front and the back of the heart at the same time, okay? Um, now, each of these chest leads, uh, precordial leads, they're very close to the heart, as you can see. So it means that the amplitude, the size of the spikes, the size of the tracing, gets taller the closer we are to the heart. That makes sense because that's where the electricity is coming from, right? So we've essentially moved our leads closer to where the electrical activity is. So we get a stronger signal. We get taller peaks and lower valleys. All right. Then, then we add the quote unquote augmented limb leads. All right. So here again, we've done some fancy electricity. AVR is the right arm. AVL is the left arm. AVF, F is for foot is the left leg, okay? So um, our patterns are similar to what we saw in the limb lead slide, except for AVR. And it's backwards, it's upside down, it has a stronger negative deflection than positive. And the reason for that, if you go back to that slide, is if you look at the positives and negatives, okay, so our positive is here, our negative is here, we've essentially flipped those two because previously this was positive and this was negative. So that's why it's flipped like that, okay? Um, now, the augmented limb leads, because there's some distance from the heart, they're not going to show us really specific um, views or areas of the heart. They're going to show us a picture of the whole heart at once, right? So like if you were trying to locate an area of myocardial infarction, all right, you wouldn't use these leads because they're too far away. You, you would use V1 through V8 or V10, right? And look at those instead because they're closer to the heart. Okay, so then we get into the, the last little bit of this is introduction to EKG. Please do not panic. You're going to have EKG like nine other times, <laughs> all right? My job is to teach you what it is, and a little bit about how it works. You're going to build up what it means as you go through clinical medicine, okay? But for now, it's about what it is and how does it work. All right, so I've been talking to you about electrical vector, right? You know that the, the heart um, tends, or not tends, the heart does depolarize at the top first, at the atria first, then the ventricles. So we have this arrow, this electrical vector going down. Well, in not healthy hearts, that vector moves around. All right, the easiest way to describe this is, let's say that you had a great big myocardial infarction on the left side of the heart, all right? Well, you now have a heart that doesn't generate the same amount of electricity on the left as it does on the right. 
that means that the vector is going to move because you have a bunch of heart cell or a heart muscle that isn't participating in creating the vector anymore. So <clears throat> we can assess what's called the axis of the EKG. All right, the axis is simply what is the direction of that electrical vector? You know, the normal case, the normal axis is 30 to minus 60, just like we've been talking about down that way, right? But in different disorders, that vector can move up or down. Okay, so let's define a circle. If we're going to talk about uh, vectors in a circle, we need to give some degree markers. So we go, and I hate the way they did this, okay, because to me it's backwards. Why not just start zero here and go around like a compass? But no, 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 that's not how we're going to do it. <laughs> All right, so zero degrees points to um, the left, right? And we go all the way to minus 180, which points to the other side. Now on the bottom, we go zero to plus 180. So plus 180 and minus 180, same thing, all right? So the um, uh, labels here, okay, so AVF, that's your augmented limb lead, your foot. Down means negative, plus means positive, electrically, all right? So we have our Cabrera circle. Well, what we can do from that circle is we can determine the electrical axis by looking at a couple of different leads, right? And then um, making some uh, assumptions. And I'm gonna turn it over to a guy who's a little better at this than me and show you a little video. Can you hit my lights for me? All right, so let's break up and look at what an EKG, so this is what somebody will hand you, or this is what the machine will spit out. Now, we've talked about all these pieces, so let's look at how they're arranged. Each of these areas, so like from here to here, here to here, here to here, from the black line to the black line, all right? Those are the tracings from different leads. So like this is the tracing from lead one, and then after the black line, this is the tracing from AVR, after the black line, this is the tracing from V1, V4, and so on. Okay, now, in a typical EKG along the bottom, you'll have these three rows of your separate leads. And then along the bottom, you'll have a longer um, <coughs> presentation of lead one. Like it'll just go, instead of having four leads in a line, it'll just be one lead all the way across. All right, so when you encounter EKGs, a lot of times they'll have four rows. The last row is just an extended tracing of lead one. All right, so we have lead one, lead two, lead three. Okay, so if we talk about our Cabrera circle here, lead one, the deflection is mostly positive, right? Lead two, the deflection is also mostly positive. Even though it's smaller, it still is a positive deflection. So our axis here is going to be in that normal area, right? Because lead one is positive and lead two is positive. Now, if we look at the different leads, of course they have a different pattern, right? Because we're looking at different parts of the heart. So like AVR, we see is almost the inverse of lead two, right? And that's because of how the electrical energy is moving. So like AVR is mostly negative, AVL in this example is mostly positive, AVF is almost neutral, see? Um, now then V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, these are the precordial leads. So what we see is from the front, at the front we have great big spikes, V1, V2, V3. As we start to move around the side, we, we get larger uh, peaks because now we're moving into the area of the electrical vector, right? So all that electrical energy is literally headed right towards V4. So in V4, we get this big old peak, okay? Now, there are a lot of things that we read in an EKG. Many of those things we don't get to talk about yet because you don't have any background for them. But for now, 
any EKG, I have a list of questions down there that you should get used to asking yourself whenever you're confronted with an EKG. First off, what is the rate? Okay, so to do the rate, we'll find a peak that happens to be on a line, right? So here we'll take the peak of V4 because that's right on this dark line, right? So there's one, two, three, four big boxes between this peak and the next peak. So based on our rules, what's the heart rate? 75. There you go, 300, 150, right? What's the next one? 175, okay? So that's our um, calculated rate or our approximated rate. Now the other one we looked at was the rule of 1500, right? So if this is five uh, little boxes, this is 20 total little boxes, so what's 1,500 divided by 20? 75. See, so we get the same answer using two different methods. Okay, so that's the rate. The reason we ask about rate is rates that are too low are not compatible with life for very long. Rates that are too high, equally so, right? In an adult, heart rates above 200, 220 are not gonna be sufficient for very long. Heart rates below 50 in an adult um, can be problematic. I'm hesitant a little there because in your very trained athletes, okay, they'll have a heart rate of 45 and they're fine, okay? It's the issue is every time their heart beats because they're in such good shape, it just pushes a ton of blood around, all right? If you have somebody who looks like me and their heart rate is 45, <laughs> less, you know, less of an okay thing, right? Um, when I was in the military, I, uh, I used to take care of Marines from time to time, and, you know, they, they would sit there with heart rates of 42, you know? Why? Because they just were in incredible shape. It's like your marathon and, and triathletes are like that too. But generally speaking, 50 to 200 is about the range. Okay, so that's the rate. <clears throat> is it regular? What does that mean? Okay, so a regular rhythm has a consistency to it. In other words, the beats are about the same distance in time away from each other. The way we see that in the EKG is that the peaks are about the same distance apart each time, all right? There are plenty of examples of rhythms that are not regular. So the, the classic one is what we call atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, the atria are kind of quivering. They're not really contracting in a pattern. They're just kind of quivering. So what we see in the ventricles is instead of the ventricles beating very regularly, they beat and then 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 beat. And then beat. You see how that is not a regular rhythm? Okay, so that's what the second question is, is it regular? Is each heartbeat coming at about when you expect it to, all right? So that's question number two. Question number three, is there a P wave before every QRS? All right, remember the P wave um, shows us atrial depolarization. Now, P waves can get kind of small. I'm pointing at them. See these little guys? Thing with an EKG, every little squiggle matters, all right? So, even this guy, does three even have a P wave? Barely. Um, so that actually, one may be a little abnormal. But this is going to be, I think that's your P wave there. Okay, so what are we asking for there? Why do I care if you have a P wave before every QRS? If you're missing P waves, it means the atria are not depolarizing. All right, so what you should see is you should see a P wave, a delay, and then a QRS, regardless of what the complex looks like, right? So like in uh, AVF, for example, we have big P waves, teeny tiny QRS waves, but we still have one of each, right? We have a P wave, we have a QRS. All right, that, a second, the next question, does a T follow every QRS? If you don't see T waves, all right, let's, let me point at some T waves. Here's a T wave, here's a T wave, here's another. This is also a T wave. Do you see how it's much smaller? It's because we're looking at it from the front. 
versus looking at it from the back. So we want to see that there's a T after every QRS. We want to see that the QT interval is flat, okay? This is key to myocardial infarction detection. When the QT segment, or the ST segment, same kind of idea, if it's angled up or angled down, we worry about myocardial infarction, okay? So we look at the QT interval. What's the predominant vector? All right, we did that first because we were just talking about that. Lead one is positive, lead two is positive. So we have an approximately normal vector, good enough for us right now, all right? Um, and is that vector normal? And then I just ask a question, why are the P waves so small in V4 and through V6? And the answer is, is they're, they're looking at it from the back. And between the atria, remember P waves are atrial depolarization, right? Well, when we look at the, the atria from the back, we're looking through the giant ventricle. So we see an attenuation of that signal, all right? So typically when you're looking, when you're assessing P, Q, R, S, and T initially, look at leads one, two, and three, okay? Because they're in, um, they're at some distance from the heart, so we get some summing of the effect. So this is, you know, putting the different pieces together. When I give you an EKG, it's basically a table of different tracings from different leads, all done at the same time. So for example, <laughs> Um, oh, here I can draw, here. So this, yeah, likely story I can draw. Okay, there we go. This complex, this one, this one, this one, are all the same. In other words, that's the same heartbeat, okay? Because what the computer is doing, it has all these leads lined up in time so that it's taking the same picture from different points of view all at the same time. So like each of the circles, these all these, are the same heart beat looked at from multiple points of view, all right? <clears throat> and when we get you into reading EKGs, which is gonna be in the spring, um, you know, we'll, we'll give you some hints about which leads give you what information. But for now, no, you get multiple pictures of the same heart beats in this kind of table of um, tracings. All right, onward, here we go. Okay, first question, what is happening between the QRS complex and the T waves? Ho oh, ho, okay, we're split between systole and diastole. All right, so the QRS is the, is the uh, ventricular depolarization. So it's the activation of the ventricular muscle. What follows that activation is actual contraction, right? We're into the plateau phase, calcium's entering, causing the cell, cells to contract. So what we see between the QRS, between the depolarization wave and the T wave, which is the repolarization wave, is actual contraction. What's the fancy word we use for contraction? Systole, okay? So ventricular systole occurs between QRS and T. It's why that interval, the ST segment, is our window on ventricular contraction. Right? So like in an MI, in a myocardial infarction, part of the heart isn't contracting right. We see that as an elevation between the S and the T. Okay? All right, next up. Positive charge is moving towards a negative electrode. What's the deflection? Sneeze, Kevin. <coughs> 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 
big one. All right, so positive charge moving towards a negative electrode is a negative deflection. Negative moving towards negative is positive deflection. Positive moving towards positive is positive deflection. It's opposites that are negative, okay? Um, that's in that, like the third or fourth slide. All right. There are 150 small lines between the peaks of two QRS complexes. What's the heart rate? <laughs> this question is written specifically because I have learned that PA students are not so good with math in their head. <laughs> Just saying. So given that fact, given that PA students are not so good with math in their head, okay. <laughs> See? Right, okay, so 1,500 divided by the number of small boxes gives you the rate. And for those of you who are calculating, calculatedly challenged, um, 1,500 divided by 150 is 10, okay? Now, is that heart rate compatible with life? No, no it's not. So um, that would be an example to sort of tie in something we talked about yesterday. This, this is the kind of thing that would happen. Let's say your SA node is dead, okay? Let's say your AV node is dead. So the only thing that you have that's automatically depolarizing is something in the, let's say, in the left bundle branch. Well, it might be ticking along at 10 beats per minute, and it's getting the rest of the heart to go 10 beats per minute, which is moving some blood, but not for very long, right? Because the cells in the brain are going to start running out of oxygen. All right, math. I sometimes joke with Claire that we should have a math class. <laughs> that's funny. All right, a precordial lead shows a QRS that's about a half above and a half below the baseline. So which lead is this likely to be? In other words, which is the most balanced of that? V1, 2, 3, or 4? You can go back and look at the pictures if you need to. Like that, right? That's balanced. In other words, if this is the line, okay, and part of the QRS is about half and, and half, that's balanced. As opposed to if this is your line and that's your tracing, this is significantly positive deflected, right? Um, and there again, V3 is the most balanced of the leads because it match it's it sits in line with the heart's electrical vector all right let's see who our winners are funny crane taking it away 